cool. So I'm excited about that. And then uh, after the break, we're going to talk about uh, strategies for dealing with multiple animals, um, uh, which there's, there's just one simple, easy answer, so that won't take long. And then um, after lunch, we'll be looking at some of the um, using the grid data and starting to visualize using M data to visualize the changing environment and aquatic animals like the top left. So that should be kind of the icing on the cake. Uh, so for the cake. Okay. Can you hear me okay? That, okay. Okay, um, so today, uh, this morning, we'll talk about step, how many people have heard of step selection functions? Good number, it looks like. Um, talk a little bit about just what they are, how you do the data development, how you fit the models, and then again, a little bit on parameter interpretation. So historically, uh, biologists, when they had tracking data, they usually didn't have observations every two minutes or every 10 minutes or every hour. So. Um, they didn't have to worry too much about whether observations were independent, and when they did worry about it, they often just subsampled their data to hopefully justify that observations were far apart enough, far far enough apart in time to be independent. Um, or they would justify independence by saying, well, between uh, in a week, an animal could have traversed anywhere in its home range, so it's independent from a biological standpoint. Of the animal could have been anywhere else within its home range in between um, two observations. So then uh, RSFs became a common approach to analyzing data because you could just define your home range and then sample available points within that home range and assume at any given time the animal could have been at any of those points. Okay. But with GPS data, now we have locations every two minutes. So those fisher, some of those fisher data that are collected, there's no way a fisher could have traversed its whole home range in two minutes. So here was our, here's our equation from yesterday. So to kind of review, um, with, steps, with uh, resource selection functions, we can think of we've got some distribution of locations on the landscape. And we're going to model those as a function of uh, spatial covariates and some regression parameters and some distribution of available points. Okay, so we're going to, you can think of this as um, these regression parameters take us from the available points to the used points, and we're just using them to describe the density of locations in space. Can anybody think about, well, how could you modify this to account for the fact that an animal can't go anywhere within its home range within two minutes? Yeah, Ashley. You could link the available points to use points that are closer distance. Yeah, so you might think about, well, the animal might only travel so far in two minutes. Let me think about the, the first approach is said, let me just draw a circle around the current point with maybe the radius being how far that animal might move in two minutes, and I'll sample from within that. So then you have matched, matched points. For each observed location, you've got a set of available locations. Okay. So that's, that's essentially what step selection functions do. They say, let me, let me think about available locations at any given time point, and let me think about generating those in terms of movement, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and, I'm not gonna apologize for it, we're gonna have some equations because you're gonna see these if you try and read the papers about step selection functions. Okay, so we're gonna define a couple things. We're, we can define um, the location at a previous time point, and then we're going to define this um, movement kernel that describes the probability of going from the previous location to a current location. And think about this as how an animal would move if it didn't respond to, to habitat at all, or how it would move if the habitat was completely uniform. Okay, so what's the characteristics? How does this animal move if it wasn't selecting for particular um, features on the landscape? And so then we can modify our model here so we can say, well, the, the distribution of potential points at the next time point will be a function of how it would move. So here's where it was at the previous time point. Here's how it would move if the habitat was completely um, homogeneous. And then we can, again, add this same sort of resource selection function that describes um, how features in the landscape impact where the animal might choose to move. Okay, um, so you might think about an animal might tend to take short steps 
Um, but if there's coffee in the back of the room, maybe they're more likely to take a little bit longer step and go, um, go to where the coffee is this morning, okay? So you, you think about movement, if, if uh, the environment was homogeneous and then overlaid is this function that you might think of as creating bumps in the landscape that are more attractive, okay? So here's a visual. I think it's always good to see equations and then think of a visual of how this works. So here's maybe you could consider uh, the, the, a current location of an animal, and you could generate available points by simulating how this animal might move, just its characteristic movement, and think about, okay, I could, I could match all of those points. I could capture the characteristics at, the, at those points where it might move and compare it to where it actually did move, okay? So now we've got matched data where we've got each used location is matched to a set of available points generated from the previous location. Okay, makes sense? Okay, so now we've got time-dependent available distributions. Um, if we knew how an animal moved in homogeneous habitat, we could, we could do this exact thing, right? We could, we could generate points if we knew how it would move and then use those available points and, and we'd have a likelihood that looks something like this where you have the used locations in the numerator and then you'd have the available and used locations in the denominator and um, this, is, this is a conditional logistic regression model. So it's a slightly different model but you can fit this really easy in R. Um, in the survival library there's a C-logit function and the only thing you'd have to do is you'd have to also include um, a stratum identifier that says all of these observations go together. So you'd have a different stratum ID to link each used location with all of the available locations that go with it. The one problem is we don't know how an animal actually would move in a homogeneous landscape, okay? So I'm curious if anyone has suggestions, you know, how would you actually, how would you simulate these sort of points? It's early. This might be a good time to just like talk to your neighbor. See if you can come up with an idea. I'm curious, like how would you generate available points? You can think about your how your critter might move. What would you do? Has anybody come up with an interesting idea? Or, or an uninteresting idea is just fine. Yeah. I mean, could you put a distribution of like distance between each point and like have a normal distribution or like a binomial and use that to generate like the average distance the animal moves? So calculate distances between locations yep. and, then and then say what, what's the average distance it moves or, or fit, a, fit some sort of di um, statistical distribution to the step lengths. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep. So essentially, um, I would call that like a non-parametric sort of bootstrap, right? You're resampling your observed steps, um, steps and potentially turn angles, or um, from from actual movements between locations. So that's another common approach. Anybody anybody else have anything else that they talked about that they want to share? Those are two good ideas. I mean, those are and two of the the more popular ideas. Um, so you could resample, observe step lengths and turn angles. Um, you could parameterize statistical distributions that describe step lengths and turn angles. Um, and so there's some common distributions here. Instead of a, a normal distribution would be bell-shaped, symmetric, could have negative step lengths. It's probably not. Um, necessarily reasonable, but like an exponential distribution is often popular. Exponential distribution usually looks something like this, where short steps are more likely than long steps, or there's gamma distributions which generalize this, and again, we'll have sort of a uh, right skewed distribution for step lengths, so that's common. Turn angles, there are statistical distributions for ang angular distributions and um, Von Mises distribution is one that's pretty common. So that's the one that's used in the AMT package. And to kind of illustrate that, because I'm, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm guessing not too many people have worked with uh, Von Mises distribution yet this morning. So here's an example. Um, there's a concentration parameter in this distribution that describes, um, so if, if you have a large concentration parameter, you're more likely to continue to move in the same direction. Uh, and if it's less concentrated, you're more likely to turn in any sort of direction. Okay. So if you've got data collected at really fine time scales, you're probably going to continue moving in the same direction. If you've got data that are every hour, maybe your turn angles look pretty uniform. So. You can see here, these are two simulated paths. The, the path with the more concentrated um, turn angles centered around zero tends to have paths that um, are more directed, cover a wider area, and the other distribution where turn angle, you're more likely to turn in any direction ends up with um, a less dispersed pattern where, where the animal's turning quite a bit, okay? So there's one more issue with this. Can I, well, I'm curious, is it, can anybody see any problems with either of those approaches? So thinking about taking your data, you have observed steps, so observed distances between points, you've got observed turn angles, and you're using that to sort of parameterize this model. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an important issue, and I didn't highlight that. So this method really assumes you've got observations that are regular in time. So you've got observations every hour, every 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's, it's, um, you've collected data systematically in time. Um, there are continuous time movement models that can relax that. They're a little bit, a little bit more challenging. Um, but th these models really make most sense if your data are regularly spaced in time. And any other issues that potentially come up? So I, I, I don't think this is, was recognized a whole lot at first, but if you think about this model, we're saying where you end up at the next time point depends on how you would move if, the, if you didn't pay attention to the habitat at all, and then you multiply that by this resource or step selection function that describes how different parts of the landscape are attracted to you. Um, and we're trying to parameterize this piece here that says how would you move in a homogeneous landscape or if you ignored um, resources and risks and conditions, okay? So we never, we never observe how an animal would move in a homogeneous landscape. So essentially, we're taking data that combines these two things, that the movements that we actually observe are a mixture of, maybe you could think of it as a mixture of how an animal would move if the landscape was homogeneous and how it's um, finding different areas of the landscape attractive. So this is a really nice paper here, I think, in 2009 that points out, 
Um, if you just resample your data, you can get some biased estimates. I, I st people still do it a ton. I don't think it's the end of the world. I think it's actually a fairly reasonable approach, but it is something um, to be aware of. So an alternative approach is to use parametric distributions. So you could, you could fit something like a gamma distribution to your data. And then it turns out there's been some really cool theoretical papers that show if you include step length and log step length, and you can include things like the cosine of the turn angles, that you can actually estimate regression parameters that modify those distributions to, to actually account for the fact that you've seen the combination of movement in a homogeneous landscape overlaid with this re step selection function. So um, what this actually is kind of an oppor this is an opportunity because if you include, you can actually include interactions between some of your habitat variables and these movement characteristics. And it turns out that this is equivalent to fitting a model, a uh, biased random walk model that describes how the animals uh, potentially moving differently in different types of habitat. So you could include an interaction between step length and say habitat type to say, I think individuals in certain habitats are moving um, in a different way, okay? So I'm not gonna, cov I'm not gonna give an example of this today, but um, this is fairly recent work, and I think it's really interesting work here. So these, these two papers uh, illustrate this idea and show that if you, if you include some of the movement characteristics in your conditional logistic regression model, you, you do two things. One, you make your estimates of those habitat regression parameters a little more robust. And then the second thing you do is you can actually take those regression parameters associated with these movement characteristics and you can modify those distributions you fit to step lengths and turn angles and actually have a better model for how the animal would move if it wasn't responding to habitat features. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a neat approach. Okay, so the AMT package um, has this function random points that does all of this in one step, okay? So it'll actually use maximum likelihood to fit these statistical distributions to your step lengths and turn angles. And then it will generate random steps by simulating random draws from those statistical distributions. Um, and then take those steps and turn angles and say, here was the previous point, let me move from that point to new points. So you can generate available points that are matched to each um, observed point. And it's, it's a, a really easy way to do this. You could do it on your own as well, right? So it wouldn't be too hard to do this on your own, but this makes it really easy to do it quite quickly and easily. And then you can use uh, the CLogit function or in the AMT package, there's this fit ISSF function that lets you um, fit these models. So we have a, a preprint that describes some of these things that I put in. There's a papers folder now on the Google Drive, and this preprint's included in there if you want to see more, more about it. Okay. So one question that comes up is how do you interpret the parameters again? Okay, so here's here's another, here's a model fit to one of the fissure, and we have the same covariates. We have elevation, population, density, forest, and then I included these the step length and log step length as covariates, again, to, to account for the fact that we don't actually observe how an animal moves in homogeneous habitat, and I wanna um, include these variables to potentially account for any bias that might arise from, from uh, trying to parameterize those distributions from observed step lengths and turn angles. We have essentially the same interpretation here as before, so if you held everything constant, and you had two observations, say one in forest, one in not, but they were at the same elevation, same population density, the animal would prefer, prefer the forest. And again, you'd have, if you exponentiated that regression coefficient, you would have an interpretation of relative risk. So you'd be E to the seven times more likely, actually 0.07, right? So times E to the minus two, more, so you'd have, um, That, that more likely 
to select the location in forest, the non-forest, that have the same population density and elevation. Okay, make sense? Okay. There's one caveat here is that we're, mod we're, we're modeling selection on a very different scale. So we're saying how does an animal respond to the habitat at a very local scale, <clears throat> which is different from what we did yesterday, which says kind of how does the animal respond to habitat if we average across a longer time period. So it turns out you get different regression parameters um, depending on the scale that you model your data at. And then you also have to recognize that if you have observations of Fisher every two minutes, they may not leave the forest within two minutes. So your, your, all of your available points and your use point might all be in the same habitat type. So if you model at too, too fine of a scale, you may not have heterogeneity in your spatial covariates to really infer much of anything. So again, visually, uh, you can think about what we did yesterday, resource selection functions you can think about you've got some big available area and the animal could be anywhere in that whole area at any given time point. So you look at where it was and then you, you'd say, well, these are the spots that the animal could have been and they're all equally likely. So you could just sample points within this, this big area. With a step selection function, you're thinking about, well, here's where the animal is now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about where it might be at the next time point. And I'm going to model selection at that very local scale. So where would it choose within this, say, this buffered area to go? So this, this paper down here um, from 2008 showed that you get very different regression parameters depending on the scale that you model your data at. And at one extreme case, um, the coefficients here, there's like a... Um, a squared relationship between the two. So you can, you can show that that happens in certain cases. Um, the things to keep, keep in mind here is that the regression coefficients won't, won't be the same. So if you analyze data at a very fine scale and you capture the regression parameters, you shouldn't expect them to be the same as the regression parameters you would get if you fit a resource selection function. The parameters for the resource selection function should be bigger than those of a step selection function. And the coefficients for the step selection function should increase as the time between locations increases. Okay, so it's a, it's a sort of non-intuitive uh, result, but it has to do with how you're modeling data on different, different spatial scales. So one thing you might want to consider is um, if you've got observations of animals at very different time scales, you may want to regularize them so that they're all um, so your data sets are all collected at similar t sort of time frequencies. So if you have some animals observed every 20 minutes and others every hour, you might want to consider subsampling the every 20 minute observations to get to an hour. Okay, so then one of the cool things about this approach though, is if you fit it, you've got now estimates of how an animal would move between time points that you could actually use to simulate data. Um, so if you wanted to say, like, what does this model imply in terms of a home range? So what would this animal look like? What would its distribution of locations look like if you um, followed it for a, for a year or more years? You could simulate data from the model and just iterate back and forth. So choose a starting location, pick where it would go next, and keep doing that and keep track of the points. And you could actually simulate a utilization distribution from the fitted model. You can ask where, does an, where might the animal go next week, how might it change, and how might it move differently in different hand, uh, landscapes and things like that. Wouldn't you need some kind of return to center of your home range function yeah. built in to, otherwise it, it could sort of just wander all around the landscape in suitable habitat. Yeah, right? so that's a, that's a great point. Um, and you do need something to kind of bring it back, or you need some way to deal with that. So. Um, this is sort of new work that people are starting to think about, like how would you take this model and simulate movements from it? And there's two approaches people have taken. One is to say there's some home range center that draws you back. So you, um, you could put in the mean of the location, say, as a regression parameter. So you've got a parameter that says, well, an animal's gonna tend to return back towards some center. And that's one mechanism that could potentially keep it from wandering off. Um, the other approach I've seen is just to make your boundaries kind of wrap around. 
which is unrealistic, I think. You know, like you end up on one side and you flip over that's to the totally other. That's totally cheating. Yeah, I think it's cheating. So, I mean, that's a really good point. But you um, could have like a parameter. You could have, if, if you sort of have the home range, uh, you know, at the end of your study, you could use the position in the home range as an interactive effect to have them move different, select habitat, for example, differently and be more likely to move back to the center and they're on the outside. Yeah, and that's as, that's as like as a covariate in each step, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So you could have some distance from center that would right. likely have a coefficient that says, yeah, you want to you an animal wants to return to center. You could also reflect at some outer boundary, say you can't take steps in one direction, you have to take steps back in the other direction. So, um, but that is I, then you can you can get stuck in the you've tried that? Everyone migrated to Florida basically. Made a reflection at the sea. If you, hit, if you want to move into the ocean, you have to do 180 degrees. End up, everyone got stuck in Florida. They kind of funneled in and there, whatever which way they stayed in the sea. And that they yeah, so I think there are problems with simulating for a long time period. And these are great points, right? You, you know, it's probably unrealistic to think an animal is going to continue to move in that way as well. So I think there's a lot of open research questions having to deal with this sort of modeling approach. There's a name for this. <laughs> There's a name for these statistical processes. There's a name for processes that go and never come back. Transitional processes in statistics, no? Might be. Might be. I, yeah. I, I, not your thing? Not my thing, yeah. I wonder if people prove that this is that kind of process of yeah. how people work on that. Yeah. If you've got all the other animals' information on them somehow. Yeah. I think the other thing, you know, some, some would argue that this is just not a realistic model for how animals move either. You know, I, I think of every model as an approximation. But um, I think the other, the other way people are thinking about how, how can you modify this sort of approach to make it more realistic and also have that feature of animals don't wander off is to think about how do you incorporate memory. So, um, you know, there, there, I know there's a few papers out there that have suggested ways to incorporate memory. I mean, you could have a covariate that reflects places you've been over some time, and then that's included in the model to say you're more likely to revisit places you've been. So I think you know again. There's a very this is a very active area of research right now. Um, Just to yeah, another point on the memory thing, right? So the problem is you might not be going to this place in 15 minutes because you really like that place, but because you're aiming for a place you're going to be in an hour that's further away that you know about that's in your memory, and so that's where that sort of uh, you know th this idea that you're picking where you are every 15 minutes or every three minutes or whatever because of the features there isn't necessarily true if the animal has memory, so it becomes more complicated. Yeah. Yeah, and there's other ways to sort of, so I think there are solutions to some of these problems, but it also increases the complexity of the modeling quite a bit. I mean, you can fit movement models that are very complex. The beauty of this is you can do that, this in an afternoon at a workshop, right? You know, like you can generate available points from this model, you can fit it, you can get some intuition. Um, to modify it, another approach, kind of speaking to Roland's point, that animals aren't always considering where they want to go in the next three minutes, but they may have some destination like the foundation whiskey bar that you want to keep moving in a certain direction um, because you're not interested in where you're going just in the next couple minutes, but you've got a longer term goal. And so two ways that you might think about that, you might have an angle towards a feature in the landscape that you want to get to and you, you can incorporate that potentially as a covariate. And then the other thing I've seen is there's at least one paper that says, uh, let me look at characteristics of the landscape outside of where you might be able to get to in the next time step and include that as a covariate. So you think about, well, I might want to get someplace quite a ways that way and I can cap capture features of the landscape that are outside of where I can get, but I will incorporate that in as a feature in steps that are in that direction. So, perception. yeah, exactly, to try and get at that, your perception range, yeah. 
Yep. Yeah, so you can, you can definitely do that. And so one of the advantages of this approach is that when you annotate your data, your available points now have a timestamp that, that's meaningful. Right? You're not averaging over some larger time point. You actually can say, I want to look at how the, this, these available points that were collected at this time point, what were, what were the habitat features at that time point? And so that can also be changing through time. So absolutely. Yeah, Dan. Um, one thing I'm considering when you talk about that memory thing is maybe they're potentially trying to get somewhere else and just maybe get there. Uh, is it acceptable to, if you know that, like there, this is a moving corridor that they're moving in, it's just the way they take to and from places, to exclude that when you're looking at trying to figure out what the resources are collecting it for? Or like yeah, so basically, should you, I, I think what you're asking is, let me see if I can capture it. So you're asking if you know there's certain parts of the landscape where the animal's definitely doing something differently to avoid or to to go in a particular area for a particular yeah, purpose. I think, I mean, you could stratify your data to say, I'm really interested in modeling um, selection for foraging, right? So I'm going to exclude I'm going to exclude time periods where the animal's really moving quickly, and I'll stratify my data and say, you know, I want to just model those those time periods where, yeah, I mean, so you could stratify by step length or something okay. like that. Well, so there's a, that's sort of a, a general field of what sometimes is called segmenting your data by using the pattern of the behavior to, the beha pattern of the movement to describe the behavior. And so, I mean, just using step length is kind of the most simple way, and there's lots of more complicated ways that are maybe more representative. Um, uh, you know, often you can sort of do, you know, the most simple sort of three would be like a resting versus moving versus something that's called often sort of area restricted search. And so that area restricted search is, you know, probably turning around looking for, it's, you know, foraging, you know, often is sort of what it's, what it's considered. But that's going to vary per species and what, and depend a lot on what your sampling regime is for, for data points. But um, uh, if you wanted to, you know, so your example, your corridor movement would be this kind of this fast movement stuff. And uh, you could do an RSF separate for those points than for the, um, uh, for the, the area-restricted search. Or like, like John mentioned earlier, you could include those as the covariates that affect the step length decision as well. So that it's kind of inherent to that side. Yeah. We're going to be looking at bird like migration kind of movements where you have some type of say homing or at one stationary area you have these local movements then you have a large 400 mile jump more local movement before like the next migration flight which is like 400 miles and can you get to the point to where that one single movement where it's an actual migrant movement is like a has some type of segment versus the other local movements and kind of piece that together or I, that'd be easy. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's just a step length thing, right? You could probably do that manually. You could just say, well, you know, like that. Anything above some step length is clearly a mic. But yeah, th so there's a, there's a ton of ways to say. That's another very active area of research right now is how best to segment trajectories. Um, they're kind of they're, they're often based uh, for the more complicated ones. Well, it would work for that too, I think, on the sort of the concept of a behavioral change point and trying to find where along the trajectory did, does it change from area restricted search to long movement or to something else. Um, and so there's some cool sort of Bayesian ways of moving through the, the trajectories and finding those change points. And um, uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool. Especially works well for more uh, higher resolution data. Yeah. Other questions? OK, yeah, so I, I'd say, you know, this is just a starting point. There's lots of. Uh, ways to modify the models, and you just think about each of those modifications a little more challenging. And I think, um, I think the thing I would recommend is have multiple tools in your toolbox, and always start simple, right? So, 
be able to graph and visualize your data. That's why I started with, you know, think about movement characteristics and being able to just plot, you know, do, our, do step lengths, do turn angles, do they vary considerably depending on what sort of habitat you're in. So you can get some, in, you can get a lot of intuition just from some simple graphical approaches versus trying to jump in and fit some really complicated model that may or may not converge and maybe takes a week to fit or whatever else, or you may not be able to interpret. So I think starting simple is often a, a really good idea. Okay. Um, so you can also ask sort of what if questions. What if I change the landscape? You can say, um, use the model to simulate, well, how would, how would this affect the amount of space an animal would, would use um, if you change the landscape, which is kind of a powerful thing to be able to do. So AM, the AMT package has some functionality right now for simulating movements, um, but that's still a work in pro progress. Uh, Johannes, who's the lead developer of this, he's, um, he's still developing those methods. And so if you've got questions about that, I, he, he's a fantastic resource, and um, I wouldn't hesitate to contact him. Okay. So just to summarize, um, now we have available points that we're generating again. So we're going to compare where an animal went to where it could have gone. But now our available points are generated by considering how an animal moves. Um, so you need to have observations, though, that are collected at sequential regular time, time steps. This allows you to relax the independence assumption between locations. You still have an independence assumption in that the steps themselves are independent. So um, it's important to keep that in mind. You have similar parameter interpretation, but now you've modeled things on a different scale. So just recognize your modeling, how animals select landscape at a very, select for habitat features at a very local scale. And again, this is a really active area of research. So I, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on, lots of opportunity for new ideas too, I think, so. Questions on this? Otherwise, we'll, um, we can go into the R code on how you would do the data development and how to fit the models. Okay, so let's let's dive into. The, you guys feel up ready to dive into the R code? Okay. So back to the the test vignette file. If you go near the bottom, there's a section labeled SSF prep. Okay, and so the first thing, like I said, um, we have to assume that all of the observations are collected at um, regular points in time. So the first thing that's a good, good thing to do is to try and summarize the sampling, the dis time distances between locations. And so you know, Johannes has put together this function summarize sampling rate, which will calculate the minimum, the interquartile, the median, uh, median, mean, max, standard deviation for um, time distances between locations. So you can see here we have eight Fisher and uh, let's see, five of them had data collected every two minutes, two had every 10 minutes, and one every 15 minutes, okay? So one thing we might do is let's, we could, we could regularize these other trajectories so that we have data collected every 10 minutes. And then we've got um, at least seven animals that are all on the same time scale and one that's slightly off. So Johannes has included a function here as well, track resample, that lets you subsample your data to get data that are on a regular time stamp. So here you can, we can say, for this individual, we want to resample the data so that we have observations every 10 minutes, and we'll leave a tolerance, say, of two minutes. So if it's at 11 minutes, we'll keep it. If it's at 13 minutes difference between two observations, we'll drop that, okay? So this is one way to get the data so that they're in a, um, so that they're regularly spaced in time. And then you get this extra column uh, labeled burst, 
that um, you can see this first one doesn't have another observation within 10 minutes. So it's the only observation in that burst. Here are two now that are 10 minutes, uh, roughly 10 minutes apart. And then there's a jump. And then we've got four in a row that are all t roughly 10 minutes apart, plus or minus two, and so on. So now you get um, data that are regularly spaced in time. And you have this extra ID that indicates these locations that are all kind of sequential and meet that criterion, OK? So if you have dots, you can deal with that. So it'll essentially treat those as separate groups of observations. Okay. And eventually, I mean, to do these sort, fit these sorts of models to, to look at steps, you need at least two observations together. And turn angles, you need three. So some of these will, like this first one, won't end up being used in the, in the, in the model fitting because you can't get a step length if you have only one observation. Oh, yeah. So it's just like sometimes you get data every hour for three days, and then you get the observation that you see the other night, and then you get all of these. Yep. So that'll, that will, that will, yeah, that'll just create different bursts for those different time points. So that's OK. Wouldn't that just create the unrealistically long test? Yeah, so it won't treat, it won't, calculate a step between that three-week time period. How does it grow? Um, because you'll have a burst that says these are more than 10 minutes apart. So it gets a new burst identifier. So it'll treat only those observations that are close enough in, in time to meet whatever criterion you specify here. So OK. So you can do this with nested data frames if every animal has the same time between. Um, I wasn't sharp enough to figure that out, so I did a loop. So for those people who like loops, I wrote a little loop to essentially um, loop over each individual. So I kept track of each unique individual ID, uh, and then this loops over each individual, subsamples the data so we get a data frame just with that individual, resamples, and this is fairly arbitrary, but you just, if you want to be able to resample individuals at different rates depending on how frequently the data were collected, this would allow you to do that. So I just took the median um, as the rate at which I wanted to regularize the data. And, uh, and then I said, I, I, for a tolerance, I took the median divided by five. I don't know. Just at the time, I needed something quick. But you can think, put a little more effort into thinking about what tolerance makes sense. Um, if it's every, if your data are collected every hour, maybe you want to have you know a 20-minute, 30-minute tolerance. You could look at um, maybe distances per unit time, so like a estimate of speed, and see if that changes a lot with time distance. So if um, you would think that if you've got really long, like a three-week time period. You want to drop that, right? So you, you know, so part of this is you might want to think about um, how critical that tolerance level is. And one way you could do that was, would be to look at the speed relative to time distance and see if there's a, a signal there. OK, so then at this, point, at this point, we filter out any bursts that don't have at least two observations, because we can't get a step length then. Uh, this step then actually calculates the step. Yes. Sorry, so are, are, you, are you then comparing like the start of one burst to the start of the next burst? No. It's, you're comparing the number of points within that burst? Within each burst. So that, that happens right here, OK? So the first step would be to just create that burst ID that says anything with the same burst ID, those are within 10 minutes of each other. And then at this point, the steps by burst says, within each burst, let me calculate the step length, so the distance between and the turn angles. So that does it by, and then if it's, um, if you have an observation from burst two and the next one's burst three, it's not going to do anything with that. So this, this is going to take the data set that is um, one observation per location, and it's going to change it into a data set that reflects steps. So this is going to create a data set that has step lengths and turn, ang turn angles as columns on the data set. And then this piece says, I want 15 random steps 
for every observe step. So this is, this is the place where all those things are going on behind the scenes. So it's fitting these statistical distributions to the step lengths and turn angles, and then it's simulating random draws from those statistical distributions to generate new, new steps. So it's 15 for each time step? For each time step. Because a, a legitimate step. Correct. For each legitimate step, it's, and you can change that however you want, but oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things you'll note is that things get really computationally intensive. Um, so now, I mean, so that's one of the challenges right now. It depends on your computing, how fast um, you can fit some of these models. But we're, we're going to end up with potentially really big data sets if you've got a really big GPS. Um, if you've got a lot of animals and they're followed for long periods of time with really frequent locations, then all of a sudden it becomes hard to fit some of these models. Yeah, so I mean, as much as possible, but be able to fit and not have to wait forever. So I mean, uh, probably two strategies, right? Probably the better strategy is to start with fewer observations and then do more and say, did my answer change? The other way is to say, I'm going to go, uh, kind of like the discussion we had yesterday, I'm going to go for the highest resolution, and then you're going to find out it's probably, you need to back off, you, and then go to lower. It's probably better to start simple and then work up. I mean, how you respond to reviewers is huge, right? So you need strategies like this. So like, that's important. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing you can do is say, okay, well, let me do, instead of 15, let me do nine. And, and then show that nine and 15, they're almost identical, right? So it doesn't matter. If you can do sensitivity analysis to say, look, yeah, my choice is completely arbitrary, but it doesn't matter, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so here's where we end up, and I should have made this slightly wider because you can't quite see it real well, but you have a, a data set now that is a little more complicated because, hmm, boy, this would be better wider, but you have, you have this case ID again that's going to be true for observed steps, so those are the um, locations that we actually saw and false otherwise. So that's our 0, 1 for used or available. Then we have, we have x1s, y1s, and x2s, y2s. So this is the start of the step where it was, and this is the end of the step where it was. You have two timestamps now again, because you have the time at the start and the time at the end. We have a distance between the two locations in terms of time. We have a step length. And then the turn angle gets a little muddled, but that's the TA here. So turn angles are these. So you made those minus 180. Yeah, I just, yeah. Yesterday was zero. To yeah, three. yep, yep. J just to keep everyone on their toes, right? So you can think in terms of different, that's important, right? OK. Um, and then we have a, an ID here as well. So. Um, and a burst, we have a burst ID too, so that we can, we can say these points all go together. Then, okay, so then I just plotted some of the data to look at used versus available. That doesn't show up real well. And then the question is, if you want to annotate the data, you've got some decisions to make, right? So you have to think about, do you want to use the location at the start of the step or the location at the end of the step, or maybe both? And same with the timestamp. Do you want to use the timestamp at the start or at the end or in between? Um, so you have different options. You could use the middle, yeah. So I'd, um, I don't have a good answer there, but I'd, I'd say what, what do people mostly do? They probably use the locations at the end because people, I think it's, I think people like to, I think it, for myself too, it's almost convenient to think about where I'm going. So like I have a way I would move if the landscape was homogeneous and then I want to make it to the coffee. So I'm thinking about where I end up as the habitat feature that's driving my movement. Um, 
but you might actually want features at both. So I think in terms of your movement characteristics, your step length may depend on the habitat you're currently in versus where you end up. So I mean, you have some decisions there to make. Consider that except the first location, you actually are. Whether you choose to annotate the beginnings or the ends, you'll annotate both because the next one will be in the next step. Correct, correct. So yeah, in terms of how you do the annotating, yep. And, and I would say there's probably, so the way um, these data got annotated was not super efficient because I wasn't super skilled with annotating the data. So I sent Sarah the huge file. And it'd be more efficient to say, I just need these timestamps and locations annotated and then merge them back into the data set. So um, be slightly more work, but not a ton. And it'd be more efficient to get the annotation done. Yeah, or you just need to write it as a text file, change the, the location long is already there, but you have two of them, so just call the, the second one if you choose to do the step end, call that location long. So have one column called location long, dash, one column called location lat, and then the other column, like the timestamp, the way the annotation wanted, all other columns will be ignored, and change it to a comma separated stuff and it will work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then after the fact, you could always say, I want to think about the average, the average of the two. Yeah, so there's some options there. Okay. Questions on how this is done? Yes. So you can, when you say you can take that picture, assuming that, that when you're annotating your environment, it's the same throughout that entire step. So that's correct regardless of where you're choosing to no, not necessarily. So I think actually one of the very first papers that developed this method, they actually, I don't remember exactly how they did it. They may have used ArcGIS or something to say, I actually want to capture a covariate that averages along the straight distance path. That would be more difficult to do. Yeah, so I mean there's different... There's different options for how you could do that. I don't think there's no way to do that with Env data, right? Unless you down what, but if you downloaded the grid like a grid, gridded landscape, then you can do whatever you want to develop your habitat covariates. So if you think about well, where I end up depends on covariates. You know, the landscape along the path. You could do whatever you want to connect, You know, to to summarize the habitat along a path. So it's. You're only limited by your ability, your computational, your skill, whether you can work with rosters and whether you can work with data like that to create your own habitat covariates. But there's nothing saying that you couldn't capture something that um, measures how habitat features change along a, a path. Yeah, and I know there's at least one paper that suggests that's an appropriate idea, right? So don't just think about where you end up. Think about um, whether you're moving in a useful direction, so something you, you want to go towards. So maybe the difference between the habitat at your current location and, and where you might end up. So another, another interesting idea. OK. Yeah. So this is just the way you present it is if the covariate start point is your end point. The way that we annotated, that Sarah annotated these data, where we said, um, let's annotate where the, where, the, where the individual might have ended up. Okay, just a, a single point. Single point. So we said, um, I'll generate 15 random locations. And then I have where the, where the next location actually was. And let me look at the endpoints of where the, the animal moved to, as well as the 15 places where we said it could have moved to. So that's how the data were annotated. OK, other questions? The model fitting that I'm going to show is, is really similar to the model fitting from yesterday, except we're going to use, instead of GLM, we're going to use this fit ISSF, but otherwise it's pretty identical. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is the Fisher SSF 2018 R file. Um, so these are the data that, the annotated data, so we just read them in. Now we've got two different times, so we want to recognize those as, as time, time data. Uh, then I rec reclassified the land class like yesterday. Looked at similar plots as to yesterday. So here you can see there's a lot less heterogeneity at this local scale in terms of, um, so again, this is uh, elevation. So how does the probability of a point being used depend on elevation as a function of elevation? So this is just kind of a smooth through the data, and then this is what you would get with fitting a um, logistic regression model. So one thing you note is like the, the linear assumptions a little bit better here. So on this very local scale, it looks like um, assuming a linear model is actually not too bad except for a few of these individuals, maybe for part of the range. Okay. So then, again, because a lot of these individuals don't experience all these different habitat types, I boiled things down to whether the end location was enforced or not. So that's just the same thing we saw yesterday. If the land class was forced, we got a one, otherwise it's a zero. So we're just creating a dummy variable that says, did you end up in forest habitat type, yes or no? Um, and then we can fit fit our model with this fit ISSF function. It says case, remember this is a, a one if it was a used location and a zero otherwise. And here's our predictors, elevation, population density, and forest. Um, I included step length and log step length again, just to make the, the model a little bit more robust to the fact that we're trying to parameterize a distribution that says how would this animal move it in a homogeneous landscape, but we don't ever actually observe that. And then we have to add this strata that says um, observations that have the same step ID all go together. So those are matching the, the observed step with all of the available steps. And we can see we get the coefficients. These are the ones that I just showed you in the, in the presentation. Um, and the nice thing about, about this function is it also gives you these exponentiated coefficients so that give you that relative risk so I don't have to write it on the board. You get it directly from the output. So you can say, what happens if, um, if this fisher had two observations that differed in elevation by one unit, but everything else was constant? Which one would it choose? And this says there's not much of an effect of population density or elevation here, but um, there is for forest. This individual would be um, almost uh, would be 1.075 more likely to choose the location in forest than the observation that was not in forest. Okay. This gets a little more complicated because there's one individual that was always, always in forest cover. So like every available point and every use point was in forest. So this gets back to, for that individual, we can't estimate a coefficient that says, would that individual more likely to choose a location in the forest or not forest because it was always in the forest. So um, that created a little bit of complications here. I had to create a function that says, um, if none of the observations, I think actually maybe none of the observations were in forest. So I had that backwards. So there's one individual that was never in the forest. So you can't say, does it like the forest or not? And so for that individual, we can't put forest in the model because you just can't estimate that coefficient. So all this is doing is saying, I need to fit a different model for those individuals that don't tell us anything about forest. And if they have at least one observation in the forest, I can actually include that covariate. And then all the model fitting, again, is done just with this little bit of line of code. It says, I'm going to take my data my annotated data, and I'm going to nest it by ID. And then I'm going to fit this model. I'm going to apply this function. I'm going to fit one of these two models. 
um, depending on the individual. Um, and I'm going to capture all those data here. So you can look at this. Again, we can look at just the first model. Here are the coefficients for it. And then we can use the, the tidy function again to figure out how do I pull off the key information from those fitted models. So here we can see the coefficients for each of the eight Fisher. We get the estimate, the standard error, p-values, confidence intervals. So we can pull all this off, which um, Yeah, so we'll talk about that um, after the coffee break. Like, How do you deal with multiple individuals? What are strategies? So personally, I think this is one of the most doable, simple strategies, um, is to fit models to each individual and then take those coefficients and treat them as data and say, um, if I look across individuals, what sort of patterns do I get? So here you can take these coefficients, and again, you can plot them. And you can say, well, all of these Fisher are preferring, appear to be preferring higher elevation. So population level inference can come at a, a second step. So you can think of this like a two-step method. First, fit a model to each individual, capture those coefficients, and then look at how those coefficients vary across individuals in the population. Here you can clearly see elevation is important. Um, forest probably, we don't have a signal strong signal there, population density, they prefer areas where there's fewer of us, makes sense. Um, so I think this is a pretty effective strategy, but we'll talk about other strategies you could consider after the coffee break. I think, you know, one of the ideas is that statistics is how do you take a big set of data and boil it down to some meaningful summary? And to me, this is a really simple way, right? So you could take for each individual, we're boiling down the data from that individual into a summary that are these sets of regression coefficients. And then we can then look across individuals to say, are we seeing consistent patterns? OK. So my hope is that, again, you might be able to take this code and adapt it to your own data if you have data that are regularly spaced in time or close to that. Are there questions on the approach? Again, we'll talk more about strategies for multiple animals after the coffee break. Yeah, I'll Alex. When you're plotting these coefficients, you kind of said that you can look at the, I guess I'd say, signal strength. I mean, is there any way you can actually like do AIC model selection or something to kind of have something a little bit more robust when you work with these coefficients? To say whether you need to include forest or not? So, I mean, model selection and model comparisons, that's a huge topic. And again, you'll find widely different views on that. My personal, my personal view is that um, the model selection and model, model comparisons, when you're just basically putting variables in and out of models, that that's way overdone. You know, I think like, what's, um, so we, you could, we could try and construct some likelihood ratio test, or we could use AIC, we could construct, we could calculate an AIC that assumes that individuals are independent and just essentially add the log likelihoods together to do an AIC sort of comparison. But um, I think it's just as powerful to say, I mean, what you, what you often see in papers are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare a model with this covariate and a model without it, without it say using AIC. And um, I get a lower AIC if I drop the coefficient. So I'll just present that simpler model. So that's one strategy. And I would say there's nothing wrong to keeping the more complex model and showing that it's, you, have a, you have a parameter that's very close to zero. So a lot of times, I guess I would argue that you don't always gain that much by dropping, using model selection to say something's not important. I would say this tells me pretty clearly it, it's not important. And I'd rather have the full model that includes that predictor and you can show that it's not important, then to say, I need AIC to tell me it's not important, then I'm never gonna see that maybe I have an estimate close to zero, but the confidence interval is huge. So maybe you just don't have information to say anything about that. And AIC is telling you you should drop it, when if you actually present the full model with a coefficient and a confidence interval, you'd say, well, 
I can't say that that variable is important, but I also just don't have a lot of information because my confidence interval is really wide. So I think it, that's my personal preference would be I always try and argue for um, thinking about how much data, how much information you have in your data, use that to kind of guide what sort of level of model complexity is reasonable, and then fit that model and just interpret those coefficients rather than trying to reduce it. That's my personal preference. Dan. You're saying, so let me see if I get the question correct. Is it important to have all of your animals located at the exact same time? Yeah. Or does it matter if they're not located at the exact same time, but the time interval between locations is the same? Correct. Or you know, maybe it's not a problem, but is there a benefit? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at 10 minutes, it probably doesn't matter, right? Because the things aren't changing at prob probably not too many things changing at a 10 minute scale. But like. I mean, what I was thinking is, like, if you had a variable that depended on time, okay. you know, then maybe, maybe you'd have a, I don't know, maybe there'd be some potential benefit because you'd be capturing more times of the day. Like, let's say you could only observe individuals twice a day. So you could choose to locate them all at noon and at midnight. Or you could say, I'm going to have half my individuals at noon and midnight and the other half at 6 and, four, you know, I think there'd be an advantage there because you'd sample more times of the day, potentially. It really depends on the animal and the questions and... But you can really have as long as the time span. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Other, other questions? Okay. We're early for the time for the... Um, a little bit early for the coffee break, um, but the coffee's right back there and not going anywhere, so coffee break could be somewhat meaningless. I'd say, you know, I would encourage you to try and work with some of these programs, and I can walk around, help with anything that we've covered, yes, you know, yesterday or today if you have questions. Um, and if no one's raising their hand, I might be in the front working, but just come and tap me, right? You know, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. Coffee break? Coffee break. Sure.